king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him. When they found him, they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Oh, Lord, we thank you for your blessing. Thank you for Resurrection Sunday.
Can you give him praise? <laughs> Hallelujah. The lamb that was slain, he is alive. He is alive. Praise the Lord. John the Baptist in John 1, when he was baptized in the river of Jordan, you can read that if you want to look that up, John chapter 1. Jesus came to the place where John was baptizing, and John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we just sung about the Lamb, the perfect Lamb. Because of our sin, there needed to be a sacrifice. Amen. And Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for you and me. I am so glad that he went to the cross and died for your sins and my sin. And we're here to celebrate today the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world needs good news. Are you thankful for the good news? Hallelujah. They crucified him. They put him on the cross. They put him in a tomb. But on the third day, which is the first day that we celebrate, which is a Sunday, the first day of the week, the Mary Magdalene and the other women came to the tomb with spices. You can read it in the Gospels. In Luke chapter 24 is when you can read it. And they came to the tomb and two men stood at the tomb. And they said, why seek ye the living among the dead? Because he is not here. He is risen. Can you give him a good hand clap of praise? I'm glad for a risen Savior. Because I was buried in trespasses in my sin. And Jesus showed up. Amen. And I ran out of the tomb. I ran out of the sin. I ran out of the shame. Aren't you glad there's deliverance? Can you give him another hand up for praise? Thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you for the cross, Lord. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good news, Lord. We thank you for loving me. I was buried beneath my shame. Wait, I couldn't. It was my turn till I met you. Yeah, I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide.
uh, celebrating the uh, resurrection. And then I have another exciting announcement to make. Um, so, you know, we're slowly getting back to rebuilding our ministries here at Harbor of Hope. A lot has happened throughout the pandemic. Uh, so we're going to try to get our, our powerhouse ministry back up and running. Our, our children's pastor, Willa Caldwell, she's back there today. So we, we thank her for all of her hard work and her just sacrifice over the many years, just pouring into our children. And, and now we're wanting to just move forward with our powerhouse, and however this looks. For the month of April, she's going to have a table out in the foyer looking for volunteers for 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. So that might ring a bell with some of you that you know that's where God has gifted you to be able to help just love a bunch of young people. Please talk to her after service. She needs all the volunteers that she can get. Amen. So let's, we're excited about this and going forward with this. So just remember the month of April, she's looking for volunteers. So uh, if you want to do that, please step up and let's, let's serve the Lord in that capacity. Amen. Let's all stand again. We're going to pray. We're going to get our hearts fixed on Jesus. We've already been worshiping him, but, but we're, we're a people of prayer. Come on, let's just, let's just talk to him now and let's just tell him how much we love him. Lord Jesus, wow, <laughs> you're everything to us. Lord, as we gather as children of grace today and those that maybe need to find grace, Lord, they've come to the right place and they're watching the right service because, Lord, today we're just talking about the good news of the gospel. Lord, that's what we're here to celebrate today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. We magnify you, Jesus. Lord, today all we can do is bring an offering of praise and thanksgiving to you because, Lord, we understand what grace is. It's unmerited favor. We could do nothing to earn salvation, do nothing to, to merit what you've done for us. It was all your grace. So, Lord, today, thank you. Thank you for that stamp of approval, for overcoming death, giving us hope today beyond the grave. Today, Lord God, if there's somebody here or watching online, listening in the parking lot that does not have that hope, we pray today, Lord God, that they would find hope in you, that empty tomb, the message of the gospel would transform their hearts and lives, and they would become children of grace to worship you like we are today. Have your way today, Jesus. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
18, these are the words of Jesus. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I like this part. And I have the keys of hell and death. Even Satan don't have his own keys. <laughs> Think about that. He's already stripped him of all his power. Amen. He is alive forevermore. Aren't you thankful? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. I want to preach today simply on the good news of the gospel, because we have a lot of bad news in our world. Can somebody say amen to that? That's the truth, isn't it? And most of the time when we see breaking news, it's going to be bad. But from now on, whenever we see breaking news coming online or on TV, may we think about the good news of the gospel. Amen. Lord Jesus, today this is a two-part message because we need to learn how to walk somebody through the good news of the gospel. But it also is for those who need the good news of the gospel today. Lord, for all of us today, your word is that that edifies. So, Lord, edify us as children of grace to learn and worship you more about this good news of the gospel and learn how to tell somebody about that great news. But also, Lord, if there's somebody here which you already know and they know, Lord God, where they are with you, may this good news of the gospel go into their hearts. 
May they hear you calling them out of that grave. May today be their life-changing moment where they're transformed by this good news of the gospel. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Just have your way today. We again thank you and we celebrate you in that empty tomb. Have your way in all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 And real quick, air five on three. One, two, three. All right. You may be seated. Praise God. Can you give our praise team, Pastor Clayton, the musicians, our sound multimedia big old hand? They work so hard every Sunday to lead us into the presence of the Lord. We're so grateful for their heart and uh, just, just the presence of God that we experience every Sunday. So I, I love how when Paul says in verse 3, he says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. Um, we know the story about Paul. He had two names. We've talked about this. Saul, a Hebrew name or a Jewish name, and Paul, a Roman name. And, and we know him in Acts where he was Saul of Tarsus and he was persecuting the church. He was, he was having Christians put in jail and if all possible even killed to have them stop spreading this gospel of Jesus. When I read this text today, it gives us two points that I want to bring out to you today. As this message was given to Paul by the ones, the disciples that walked with Jesus and knew him personally and watched him. Paul, Paul received the gospel from the disciples as they witnessed the life of Jesus. And I just want to talk to you today about, number one, Christ died for our sins. And number two, he rose again the third day. <laughs> Amen? First, though, let's, let's just dive into this. Christ died for our sins because Paul begins making this case for the gospel. What is this good news? What is the gospel? And he begins to dive into this by first going to the scriptures. He said that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. We must always look to the word of God to find truth. Amen. And there was Paul directing the readers to, to, the, to the scriptures of Old Testament. Where he says, according to the scriptures, God had spoke to the prophets and they had already wrote down and tried to prepare you that in the scriptures they declared that Christ, the Messiah, was going to die for our sins. And we can find these scriptures and I just want to read a few of them today and we are familiar with Isaiah 53 Verse 5 and 8, remember this was written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born and became God in the flesh, all right? God was preparing through prophecy that Christ must die for our sins. It says in verse 8 of, of, of Isaiah 53, it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. According to the scriptures, Christ died for our sins. You go to Daniel 9, 26, it says, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. You see, Messiah died for us. The whole chapter of Psalms 22 could be backing this claim that Paul has that the scriptures foretold that Christ had to die for our sins. But if we just looked at verse 1, 16 and 31, it says, verse 1, it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? And when Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And at that moment, Jesus was paying a part of our sin debt that is, is, I think, one of the most brutal because, you see, sin separates us from God. And that's going to be the worst part of hell is that there is going to be no presence of God in hell. That, that, that will be tormenting. No hope, no presence of God, at least here in this earth. There's always a, a, a glimmer of hope that, hey, you know what? I can turn to the Lord at some point in time. But when it's all said and done and a person chooses to be separated from God because they, they did not want to spend eternity with him, then that's going to be, I think, that brutal part of hell is that God's presence will not be there. And on the cross, Jesus was dying for our sin, paying our sin debt. And at that moment, when he became sin for us, the father took his presence away from his son so that he would endure the separation that we should have been enduring, right? Because of our sin, Jesus was perfect. What a savior, y'all. What a savior. Verse 16, my for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 31, they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. You see, Christ died for our sins. And then Zechariah 12, 10 says, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Paul is saying that the gospel here, that this, this good news that Christ died for our sins was according to the scriptures. He was saying, listen, the Jews should have recognized the Messiah because he, he spoke through the prophets that this was what he was going to do. Amen? My friends, we could look at the Bible and we could sum the Bible up in three verses. First, Genesis 22, 7, where Abraham and Isaac are going to Mount Moriah and, and Abraham was walking in faith and obedience and Isaac looked at his daddy, Abraham, and says, we got everything for a sacrifice, but he said, where's the lamb? And Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb, son. And you can look at all the Old Testament and ask that question. Where is the lamb? Where is the Messiah? Where is the Christ? And then we come to John 1, where John the Baptist is there at the Jordan and he sees Jesus and he says, Behold the lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Where's the lamb and Jesus, the lamb of God? God provided the world his, his sacrifice, his, the lamb that would die for the sins of the world. And then as we just sung, you go fast forward and get a glimpse into eternity. Revelations 5, 12, everybody's going to be gathered around the throne. And what are we going to be saying? Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. Yes, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Where's the lamb? <laughs> Jesus, behold the lamb. And one day worthy is the lamb. Yes, we go to the word of God. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. But with that first point, I want us to bring out something else in that. Christ died for our sins. Not for his own because he did not sin. Christ died for our sins. The Bible teaches us three things about sin, my friends. Listen, listen to this. Number one, all have sinned. Number two, the penalty for sin is death. But number three, the penalty for our sin was paid for by Jesus. Christ died for our sins. I want to back up and just talk a little bit about this because I, I want us to really realize this truth about sin. All have sin. If we can pull that slide up there, it says in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
maybe you've asked the question, or maybe somebody asked the question, what is this sin thing? What is sin? You see, God gave us a standard of righteousness when he gave the world the Ten Commandments. If you can keep those commandments, my friend, you will be all right. You are righteous and you will make your way to heaven. Come on. But all have sinned. Number one says, thou shalt have no other gods besides me. In other words, you're to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Never once, one ounce of a second were you ever selfish. In all of your life, God has been number one. The first one takes us all down, don't it? Come on. We ain't even got to go to number five, honor thy father and thy mother. Come on. Now we're looking back at our childhood. Or what about number nine? Thou shalt not bear false witness, you shall not lie. The Bible is true when it says all have sinned. The Bible says in Romans 2.15 that God has written his law on all of our hearts. And there's a conscience that bears witness of every time that we break God's commandments. What happens when we lie? There's a conviction that takes place. You steal something, you're looking around your shoulder because you know it's wrong. He said, uh, adultery. He said, if you look with lust at a woman or man, come on, you looking with lust is the same as committing adultery because God knows your heart. He said, hatred was the same as murder. We can never keep this law, ever. Ever. But there's a conscience, conscience, conscience with knowledge. Whenever we break God's commandments, we do it with the knowledge that we're in the wrong. That's why we're convicted. It's God's little mechanism to draw us to him. Where he's telling us, you're missing the mark. You're missing the mark. And as hard as we try, we'll never hit that mark. Ever. So now it comes to a little bit more bad news. All have sinned. And then there's the penalty. The penalty of sin is death. Just like there's a penalty for breaking the laws of electricity, the laws of gravity, the laws of our world, there is a penalty for breaking the law of God. And what is it? It's death. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 5, 12 explains this a little bit more. It says when Adam sinned, sin entered into the world. And Adam sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And it's not just a physical death, but it is a spiritual death. Remember, sin separates us from a holy God. So we all know that we're going to pass the way of death one day. Everybody in here, there's, there's, there's 10 out of 10. We're all going to die. Why do we die? Because we have sinned. Because Adam sinned. We die because we sin. But when we die physically, that's when the soul is separated from the body. But there is a second death that we need to be concerned about. Because the second death is, is when the soul is separated from a holy God for all eternity. You see, the good news about this is, is that the penalty for our sin, <laughs> Jesus paid for that. He paid our sin debt of death. The separation. Jesus paid our sin debt. So there's bad news that we've all sinned. It's even worse because now there's consequences. The penalty of sin is death. But Jesus paid our sin debt for us. Romans 5 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You go on to verse 18 and 19, and it says, Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Christ died for our sins. Can somebody praise him for just a moment? Amen. Wow, what a Savior. However, 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 all of that is in vain if that tomb 
was not empty. We would be just like any other religion on the face of this earth if the tomb was not empty. And now Paul goes into the second phase of explaining the gospel. Christ died for our sins, was buried. And then our second point today, he rose again the third day. Amen. <laughs> and then he goes about his case in the building a foundation for the resurrection in two ways. First, again, Paul goes to the scriptures. He says, according to the scriptures. And then he, he backs it all up according to eyewitness account. Okay? First, let's look at what he says. He says, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Again, Paul is looking to the prophets and he's saying God tried to prepare this world for the Messiah. That not only Christ would die for our sins, but God spoke to the prophets and they wrote down that Christ would rise after three days. We read in Psalm 16.10, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol or among the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. God did not allow His Son to stay in a place of death, but He raised Him from the dead. <laughs> We find in Hosea 6.2, after two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we might live in his sight. Speaking of a three day of, of, of in the grave and a resurrection taking place. Jonah, that, that was all about Jonah being in that whale. It says in Jonah 2.10, so the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto the dry, dry land. It was, he was in the belly of the whale for how long? Three days. And Jesus, even in his ministry, pointed to Jonah to say that was the sign. You see, he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. God had already spoke to the prophets to prepare the world through the prophets that Christ would come and die for the sins of the world, but that he would rise again the third day. And then he goes from according to the scriptures, and then Paul just begins going and downloading according to eyewitness. He starts saying, and he was seen by. And let me just say today, if you were in a court of law and you had as many witnesses come and testify against you as those that saw Christ rose from the dead, you are in trouble, my friends. <laughs> you are done. Listen to what he says. He says he rose again the third day. He was seen by Cephas. Who's Cephas? Peter. Then by the twelve, the twelve, that, that symbolizes his disciples, the ones that he had poured into for his earthly ministry. They all seen him die and they all seen him after he rose from the dead. He says he was seen by over 500 at once of whom the greater part remain to the present day. At one time, over 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus. Come on. In other words, Paul is saying, if you don't believe me, go find one of those 500 people that saw him and ask them. Right? We're talking about him making a case through eyewitness accounts. And if you were in court and over 500 people stood in that chair and said, I saw him do it. I saw her do it. I saw him do it. I saw her do it. My friends, you're done. My friends, how can we not believe the testimony of the gospel that the tomb is empty? <laughs> wow! And he goes on, he says, and he was seen by James, then the apostles. Why is James so important? Because James is the brother of Jesus. And according to John chapter 7, the brothers of Jesus were trying to talk Jesus into doing more of a public ministry so that everybody would believe in him. Because the Bible says, therefore, even his brothers did not believe in him. Even the brothers of Jesus did not believe that he was the Messiah, the Christ. 
James was one. But now James is mentioned here as sin under Christ. Because it's cool. In Acts chapter 1, we see where Christ, the risen Savior, comes to the people. And He tells them He's going to send the Holy Spirit. Wait for that promise. And then they see Him ascend. And then this prayer group comes together and they begin seeking God and praying. And in the midst of that believers, those believers in that prayer group, guess who was there? The brothers of Jesus. My question is, how do you go from an unbelieving brother to a believing brother? Well, when you see Jesus die and be buried and then see him after he died alive and rising from the dead, you're going to be a believer too, amen? <laughs> Guess who saw him? The brother of Jesus, James. And now, now we have the gospel, and, I mean the letter of James. He made the canon of the Bible, right? I mean, how beautiful is that story? What happened to James? He saw Jesus alive after he died. Then all the apostles, all of them saw him. And then you go on and Paul says, and then, and then I seen. I seen. And that was when, when Acts chapter 9, when, when, when Saul of Tarsus is on his way to go find more Christians and get search warrants, you might say, to go find more Christians that have not put in jail or even killed. The resurrected Savior appeared to him on his right way to Damascus there on the highway. And Paul said, I've seen Jesus myself. And now you just look at the life of this Saul of Tarsus, who was one of the greatest persecutors of the church, become one of the greatest preachers known to the church. How did that happen? Because he saw the resurrected Savior. My friends, what is this? This is the gospel. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. It says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So here was Paul just giving us the simple good news of the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. Now church, this is the gospel that you and I are called to proclaim to the world. We're called to love people into the kingdom preaching this truth right here. If you're trying to preach this without love and using judgment, then you're a hypocrite. Come on. He's called us to love people into the kingdom. Not qualify who should come and who shouldn't go. And I'm not going to talk to them. And this sin's bigger. That sin's all. I, no, he called us to go into all the world and preach this. Christ died for our sins. Nobody's excluded. Come on. He was buried and he rose again the third day. That's our mission. Go preach in love the gospel, the good news to people. Amen. Amen. Today, my friends, this is our call. This is how simple the gospel is. Can we go to the next slide? This, Romans, that Roman road is just so beautiful, isn't it? It just tells us everything that we need to know about God, about, about Jesus is, is the you know, our sins and what he's done to bring salvation. And how do we get saved? It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you, should, you will be saved. It says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I mean, it's just so simple to us receive this gift of salvation, isn't it? We've made the gospel too, too complicated. Here's the gospel in four words. Jesus took your place. Here's the gospel in three words. Him for you. Here's the gospel in two words. It's going to get theological. Substitutionary atonement. All that is is there was an exchange that took place. Jesus died in your place. The gospel in one word. Grace. 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 
I'm going to add two more words to grace. Justice and mercy. Justice is when you get what you deserve. Mercy is when you get less of what you deserve. Grace is when someone steps in and serves the punishment that you deserve so that you can live free. Grace. 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 Do we deserve it? No. Can't earn it? It's all God's grace. So we, we close this service today by saying we're celebrating salvation today, aren't we? Because the tomb is empty. Yes, give him praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. But we don't ever want to take for granted that we're here and there, there might be somebody here today that has never accepted the message of this, this good news of the gospel. That's why we want to make sure that everybody here, we have Bibles for you. We, we have instructions for you. We want to make a relationship with you to help you disciple. That's what it's all about, amen? <laughs> so today, we, we just want to go to God in prayer, and then, and then I'm just going to ask you to be real with God. And we're just going to make sure everybody's right. Everybody has heard and understood this gospel, and you had the opportunity to, to receive the truth in the gospel. Amen. Let's just pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. We are so, so humbled by this good news today about the gospel. Because Lord, as we talk about sin, we see those Ten Commandments. We, we know because of that conscience, we know that we've all sinned. But Lord, as we celebrate that you paid our sin debt of death, and separation and you're you're amazing and today is is our super bowl day because the tomb is empty the gospel would be hollow if the tomb was still filled with your body but you rose from the dead today you offer us life that was the stamp of approval on who you are in your ministry the miracles the gospel so today, Jesus, we know you're a living Savior and you're here right now. And we've been worshiping you. You've been present with us. And we've been magnifying you. But Lord, we also just acknowledge that there may be somebody here today watching online in the parking lot. And they're listening to the gospel today. Maybe, Lord God, they're, maybe they're just not where they need to be with you. I believe you've already been in their heart and you've worked on them and you've told them things and you're drawing them. I already believe that, Lord God. You've already been speaking to them and they know today that they've been brought here to hear how much you love them. To hear about the good news, this grace, the gospel. Lord, today all we could ask is that, Lord, they would finally just surrender their lives to you. That's all we could ever believe and pray forward to happen because we just want to see as many people saved and we know we know that's your will as well but you've given us that choice Lord God right now will you honor this time as we just we just focus on you in prayer and, and we give the, the opportunity to receive this free gift of salvation to people that may be here today or online church will you just focus on the Lord right now and just, just, just speak with him and I just want to ask there's anybody here that wants, wants to know Jesus as your Savior. He's brought you here for this moment today to receive salvation, eternal life. You can become a child of God today. If that's you, would you slip your hand in the air and just leave it there for a few minutes just so we can see? I want to know how to close this service. I'm not going to ask you to come up front or nothing. I just want to pray with you. You know, while you sit there talking to God, if there's unconfessed sin in your life, I just, just throw your hand in the air and I just want to be able to pray for you. Amen. If there's anybody at home, you know who you are, the parking lot. Lord Jesus, you've seen every heart. Lord God, we just know that you, you, you're, you're involved in all of our lives right now because you're omnipresent. Everyone out online, at home, Lord, everyone, Lord, in the parking lot and in the sanctuary. Lord, right now we come before you. Lord God, I just stand on, 
on your word there in Romans. It said, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God, you raised Jesus from the dead. You said we could be saved and whosoever would call upon you shall be saved. Lord, I pray that right now, if there's somebody that's viewing or here that didn't raise their hand, you know their heart. I pray that they would just, Lord God, call upon you right now. Jesus, you know my heart. You know my life. You convicted me when I saw those commandments. Jesus, will you forgive me of my sin? I believe you, Jesus, and I believe I need you, Jesus. And I believe you are alive, that you rose from the dead. Jesus, will you be my Savior today? Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, right now, if somebody just prayed that simple prayer of faith, Lord God, believing, Lord, you said they were saved. Lord, I pray that they would feel your presence right now, Lord. I pray that they would feel, Lord, burdens lifting. And Lord, if there's any still questions and things going on, that, Lord God, they would know we're here for them. This is a safe place to talk as we disciple and get stronger in Christ. So, Lord, thank you. <laughs> You're amazing. Help us now, Lord God, to go from here, these walls, these four walls. We are the church. We learned that last Easter. We don't have to be in here. We are the church. Now, Lord God, use us for your glory and as witnesses to your kingdom as we go now and live the gospel and also tell this gospel message to the people all around us in our world. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for what you mean to us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. Let's all just stand one more time. Can we praise him with something? Can we just praise him with something? Oh, let's just praise him. I put, do you see the deer? The deer in the headlights. I love it. I love it. Yes. Our mission is accomplished for the day. Hallelujah. Glory. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I know. I know. I see smoke coming out of your ears. It's all good. I love that man. He's he, just, I love messing with him, though. I love it. Let's praise the Lord. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.